Guys, this is Coach Green Gene coming at you, the Managing Director of Harmonic Connections, plus the lead instructor and developer of the 3H Intro to Pre-Apprenticeship Workshop for young people ages 12 to 17, where we focus on basic uh, construction uh, safety, skill work, and technology, where, and our training modules uh, introduce a basic skill set um, uh, self-sustaining skill sets and uh, indigenous values that promote responsibilities to honor, respect, and protect self, family, elders, our environment, and culture itself. So with the success of this particular workshop, we've had parents uh, ask us questions as it relates to uh, tools out there that their young people can access as it relates to them uh, having information on navigating their career path as a craft or tech or design professional. Hence was the birth of this particular uh, online discussion, paper versus paper, where we actually have an opportunity to sit down and to discuss with today's professional, I guess a more or less historic um, uh, challenge around uh the the dichotomy if you will uh 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 of the education of uh, in the academic world versus the education in the vocation world and why it in in any means is is being split off or itemized in that in that particular faction but anyway um i'd like to uh take this moment uh, to go ahead and get started with uh, with our dis online discussion today. I am very, very excited because uh, I have an individual here who is not only a profession in his own right, but a friend. Uh, and his name is Dr. Pancho McFarlane. And uh, Dr. McFarlane, Baba Pancho, I wanted to welcome you to our discussion today, Paper versus Paper. Thank you for being with us, sir. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you thanks. so much. <laughs> and I just wanted to open it up, man, just by just asking, me, uh, asking you to just kind of share a little bit about yourself just so that our audience can um, know who you are and what it is you do, sir. Okay, okay. Um, I was born in in small town, Illinois. Yes, and um, I moved very, when I was a young man to uh, the mountains of New Mexico, to rural New Mexico in a Mexican American community. Um, my mother's from that area. She's a Mexican American woman with, um, in that area. Uh, they practice a number of indigenous traditions that we don't even recognize are, are such, but in, in mm. uh, including the food, but that's what I'll talk about a lot, I imagine today. Um, I got a, uh, I did well in school and school was, um, I, I thought our schools were very, were not very good, but were good at teaching certain kinds of things, certain skills at least. Yes. Um, I think they were bad at other things, but they, they taught certain skills. And I think I took that along with, um, family support, uh, ended up getting several degrees, well, several, three, I ended up getting a PhD in sociology Yes. and, and beginning to work as a professor. I came to Chicago 15 years ago. I'm very, mm. going very rapidly through my biography because in between I've had three children. Yeah. Um, but I came to Chicago 15 years ago and began. Um, it was a new sort of thing happening for me. I was gonna really. This was gonna be my job. My my uh, where I was gonna stay for a while. Where I was gonna put down roots and and take a stand for a little bit. And so I got involved very quickly in community stuff. I was living in uh, Chicago, and um, I mean, within within the first few weeks I got to Chicago, I was involved in a community organization there, mm -hmm. and I got I got heavily involved in that. And then one of the things it was a health organization called Healthy South Chicago, mm -hmm. and they had four tracks, and one of the tracks was um, food. It was a food access track. I think or I, I think that's what it was called. Yeah. And uh, part of that had to do, they had a community garden there. And that's, I was coming from that a little bit anyway. I started to dabble in that as, as a graduate student and something that was always part of my life as a kid anyway. Um, but the community gardening was was uh, a newer thing for me. So I, I kind of liked that. And then I moved to Roseland two years into my um, stay here in Chicago. And I was ready then to get fully hands-on with some of the knowledge I had and, and ideas I had. And then 
a um, garden was opening five blocks from my house here in, in Roseland. And I went one day, I found out that they were going to have their second work day, I think, of the, of the year. I went and there was a bunch of people and I just got involved. And then I took to it so much and I liked it so much. I thought it was so important that I put a lot of effort into training getting myself trained and educated, uh, not only, not, not a lot of formal education, a little bit of formal education, but not much. It was mostly being educated through uh, people mentoring me, yeah. uh, elders, elders mentoring me. And I would, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't, um, if I didn't mention who they are, Gregory Bratton, yeah. uh, Baba Fred Carter and Dr. Jafunza Carter. Um, yeah. And then a lot of other people that would just would come in and I, I, once I got involved in the garden because of my position in the university and things, and um, I was elevated to a position of leadership right away. Mm. And so I got to meet a lot of people. And so a lot of people would come into the garden. That's I was very focused on trying to get people to come in the garden. And there would be a lot of elders with a lot of knowledge and I would learn from them. And some of them came in once or twice, but others stayed a season. Some of them had stayed with us for a while and I continued to learn from them. And, um, and so then I became, I was doing some other work. Um, I've published a few books on um, rap music, Chicano, uh, Mexican Americans and rap in particular. And I was doing that work and I was also training myself in the growing world and the food justice and food autonomy world. Yeah. And um, so then at, at some point I just decided to fully go into the, the food world and get, just immerse myself in it and had some really good, I was very fortunate to have the mentors that I had, as, as, as I was saying. Um, and and then, so a lot of the elders that would come in and just people coming in and you learn from the kids and you learn, you learn from everybody out there. So, yeah. uh, so that's, that, that's my, my story. For now. You know what, you know, uh, Bob Pancho, I'm glad you uh, took time to just kind of, kind of uh, lay that out for us. That's kind of how we met. You know, we yeah. met through a yeah. uh, uh, a project that uh, 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 that was done. The um, uh, is, I'm drawing a blank right now. Well, that's but, okay. That's yeah. okay. So, um, Baba Fred and, and uh, Fred Carter, yeah. and Dr. Jafunza, yeah. and Carter, uh, came on me. <laughs> I well, they, they asked me to join them and help them out a little bit on a few things, but they yeah. they organized a, a permaculture design course. Yeah. That focused not just on this the science and design of permaculture and the art, <clears throat> but on making sure it fit our needs in our community here on the south sides of Chicago all the way down to the to the uh, rural areas in Pembroke. Um, yeah. Doc, Doc likes to talk about that corridor, uh, I-57 corridor between Pembroke, Illinois, south of Chicago, 45 miles south of Chicago, all the way up to um, to the south side of Chicago where we all live yeah. and uh, including where you live over in, in Homewood and all that kind of stuff. And that, and that area um, is, is very important. So how do we, and it is neglected and it has been, uh, it's been impoverished. Mm. It, it, it's happened to these, to our communities. Okay. Yeah. So they've been impoverished. And so we need to fit any kind of um, science or design or technology yeah. to our needs, our specific needs. Yeah. And so, and I think the permaculture design um, is flexible enough for that. I think it's built into that science. But I also think um, our indigenous practices uh, were always flexible and changing and understood uh, that you have to work with, because we work with nature so much, nature changes. It's not just, you know, one thing. Yeah. So I think, um, so anyway, that, that was that, that, that's how we met, right? That was. The yeah. Point. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for breaking that down and laying that out because that was such I guess a monumental moment in my life as a as a professional, you know, and even the development of Coach Green Jean, you know, having uh, uh, having them uh, provide us with that, you know, formal education. Because when actually when I was uh, was a part of that particular uh, program, I was trying to search out and understand, you know, being you know someone in the construct construction industry, how that related, you know, to what it was I. I that yeah. I, you know, that I do from on a daily basis, and realize that there was, uh, there was a, a great connection, you know, uh, with working in the earth, and so, you know, uh, having people uh, uh, come a part of the workshop, the three H pre apprenticeship workshop, is saying the parents and having question and and wanting their children to actually be in act 
action with working with their hands. You mm -hmm. know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you know. I have this theme where uh, with what I do, I want to restore the dignity of labor because mm -hmm. you know, in yeah. today's society, uh, individuals, um, you know, flow away from uh, activities that uh, actually deal with labor or working with our hands, but there's a value and there's a goal in the essence that, that, uh, is very important to, uh, our lives today, even in our, ch our children being developed as, as professionals that we don't want to grow away from. You, can you speak a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, it's something I, Oh, oh I, I think about this all the time and I, and I learned very early on uh, mm -hmm. about the dignity of labor. I, I you know, as a kid, um, I saw my uh, parents, uh, my, not my father so much because he passed very, very early, but I saw my mother, I saw my grandparents, I saw my aunts and uncles work so hard um, at um, laboring jobs. They were, they were, uh, they did, they did well. They worked, they worked hard. Um, you know, they, they grew up, um, that is my mom's generation, my grandmother's generation grew up with, with almost nothing. Coal miners in uh, Colorado, you know, wood, uh, dirt floors and outhouses and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. not with anything necessarily w w wrong with uh, living sustainably, which was what they did, but they were forced mm -hmm. to live in those conditions. And then they were able to work hard and do well. Um, thanks in, in large part to my grandmother, who was a very good um, steward of her brothers and sisters and then my mother. Um, and they were able to do, provide us with a, a decent life at that time. But it was still a struggle, and it was like, oh, I don't want to do that. That's that looks. They look like truckers to me. I don't. You know, I don't want to do that. And they didn't. And they didn't want that for me either. So I. But I equated their struggle with their labor in some ways. So I. I, I felt like, in some ways, it, the, the labor itself, the work in the mines, or like um, the nursing um, in steel mills. These were the kinds of jobs that my family had, and and. Um, I, I associate the work itself with indignity. Mm. Um, undignified was not the work, but being forced uh, by a boss, being and, and being and, and uh, being in the conditions of a racist society, whereby uh, even though that work is valuable and you're contributing to society and everything else, yeah. uh, your life is is made more miserable because you're a working class person and because you're Mexicano in this, in, in our case. Yeah. So, um, so I, I grow, when I was growing up, I understood that work to be undignified. Mm. And so, um, and I wanted to run away from that in some ways. There was shame, there was yeah. shame associated with it. Yes. And I went, I went to college and, and I think there was shame associated with it for those who were doing it too. My aunts and uncles, my mother, my, you know, my yeah. grandmother. There was a little bit of shame, and so they always pushed us towards a way uh, the academic uh, track. The ac academic track, exactly. Yeah. And within academia, as you know, within the educational system, as you know, is there's a tracking system anyway, right? There's a vocational track, right. and then there's a the college-bound track. And you always want to be, uh, for us, on the college-bound track because that meant a way out of your condition and away from the undignified work. <laughs> uh, uh, right. That's how we were thinking. Right. Correct. Undignified work of auto mechanics, of carpenters, of welders, of all those people that actually made our lives work. Exactly. <laughs> we understand that, right? We understand that was yeah. hard labor and that was what you did if you couldn't cut it to go to college. That's yeah. how, and that's, and, and not that we're bad people thinking that. Now I think about it, there's a little bit of shame for me thinking about how I was yeah. acting at the time, but that's yeah. the way we the education talk system about works. We, yes. Yeah, that's the way the education system works. So uh, of course I was gonna think that. But as I got smarter, as I you know understood things better, uh, going through becoming a professional, becoming an arrogant you know academic scholar who thought he knew everything and all that, um, but fortunately I had a good grounding in in, in my culture, and so I never in, in, in you know in, in certain good family values. So I didn't take that too far. Let me say, I mean, even though I, I became you know in in some ways elite or whatever an elite. Um, I still was grounded a, a, enough in my family values not to not to lose myself in that bullshit. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, uh, so, but then I start but very early on in in my college career. I was introduced to ideas about work. Mm -hmm. uh, I had good sociology professors. One in particular, uh, Devon Pena, who was also a mentor. He was my undergraduate mentor. 
but it was also a, a, a big uh, important individual in theorizing and getting out the information around food autonomy, indigenous food systems, and uh, yeah. Yeah. the stuff that we're doing. And so uh, anyway, so I got to say his name too, uh, De Juan Pena. Yeah. He introduced the ideas of, of work. He wrote a book. He wrote a book about work in which um, in the dignified nature of work, and from a Marxist perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was always attached to this. And then I started uh, reading more about it. And I always introduce, uh, we always have discussions of work in my uh, class where we talk about the economy. The work is the central, it is the central thing. Don't think it's, you know, the bosses and the guys who, you know, who are flaunting their money and their boats and the guys who are on Wall Street. You know, what is essential is the work that we do, right? Putting the, the world together with our hands. We also use our brains, right? And as you also yeah. often. We all, what we need to do often we don't is with our hearts too, but we the work that is important is the one that we do with our hands. There is no doubt about it. So um, I, I, I learned that. It took me a minute to learn that, uh, but it learned I learned it more uh, theoretically. But I also was able then to see uh, become more understanding of what my family went through, the laborers, the, you know, people working in stimulus, I mean, dying because of the work, they got lung, you know, um, lung disease and shit because they worked in coal mines, you know, yes. uh, all kinds of um, ill health effects. That was what was going on. And that's why I didn't want to do that. That's why I said, you guys are suckers. Well, why are you doing this? You, why didn't you go to college? What's wrong? You know, but then I, so I started to understand what they did and, and the reasons why they did it and why they had to do it. Yes. I started investigating it more seriously as a way of um, making a contribution to our society by by doing what you do, which yeah. is trying to get this idea of bringing the dignity back to work. And and so I knew it theoretically. I, I was looking at my family history, but then I also um, decided that if I was going to walk the walk, I had to like get my hands dirty and learn. And so and I slowly was introduced to that through some lifestyle changes. Um, things I learned about the centrality of food and, you know, so I slowly started doing this. And then by, like I said, by the time I got to Chicago, I fully immersed myself in the, in the, uh, in food. And so yeah. it, it was even more important um, as I'm learning and I'm theorizing, thinking about it in my head and learning through, through my hands. Uh, it was even more important to talk about work and the, and the importance of, of, of the hands and the, and the head and now, of course, always putting that other piece of it, which, again, what I get from our values, from our family and our indigenous cultures, um, is the heart, too. Yes. Yeah. Which is often left out of the other of the other part. You know, there's a split between the head and the hands yeah. and the heart uh, completely, I think, in the, in terms of the economy. Right. Mm. For your ability to make them money, not for, you know, your ability to uh, develop your community or your relationships with people, you know, they I want you to talk about it, yeah. your hands. Oh, they want your muscles. That's what they want from you. Right. Uh, we're, we're full beings. So we're not going to go for that. Right. We're, right. we're no longer that's going right. to go for that. That's so right. yeah, work is, yeah, that, that stuff, that, the stuff that you talk about is, is central. It's very you, important. You know what? Thank you for Baba for taking your time and just speaking with us during, you know, about your process, because I think a lot of us, you know, as parents and mentors kind of share that as minorities uh, within America, that, that particular process and that wavelength, you know, me being a graduate at Tuskegee University in architecture mm -hmm. and, you know, having, you know, my father and mother, you know, pay the way for me and do as th what they needed to do in order so that I can succeed. You know, how dare me to get on the, on the other side and start thinking another way. But my pathways yeah. uh, as, your, as, as, as similar with yours was challenging, but you know, I heard you speak a lot about mentors. You know, it's a lot of mm -hmm. you know, conversation that you have talked about as, as far as indigenous practices that we should hold on to as professionals today. And this is the thing yeah. that we want our emerging professionals to consider and to think on as they succeed academically, because we cannot get away from you know, working, you know, with our hands, which which is actually a great segue into uh, what you're doing, you know, in the, 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 the south side of Chicago. Sure. And so I wanted to kind of just show some of the pictures as you, uh, Baba, started talking to, to us about, you know, what you're doing and how we can reach out and touch you okay. and uh, be a part sure. of what you're doing. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, and I want to say, you know, as we're looking at the, the pictures, 
the point about mentorship, I mean, that's what we call it. We call it the mentor thing, you know, but think about how we learned prior to sort of the, the Western formal education system. We learned through mentorship. Uh, yeah. you know, if you wanted to learn how to, you know, plant or hunt or sow or anything, you would go to the person who knew how to do it and you sit there and you would watch them and they would, you know, they'd say, they'd say, give you, you know, uh, here's a project to do and you'd fail and you'd fail and fail and fail until you got it and you would keep working. That's how you do it. Yes. And some of the, so, and you know, I've been teaching a long time uh, now. I've been in a, a university setting um, as a, as a professor uh, over 20 years. Uh, but I've been in the formal education system since I was four years old. Mm. Since I started kindergarten at four years old, I have never gone more than a few months without being in that system. Okay. Yeah. So fully, I'm fully indoctrinated in that system, but um, as I've had, you know, the good fortune again of, of maintaining my family values and maintaining, uh, I mean, our, our values and not family values, but our yeah. values and yes. family, our traditional values and stuff and having good mentors, men and women, Mexicanos and uh, Mexican Americans and Chicanos and um, black and African, um, mentors, men and women, elders, um, I, 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 I was able to be pulled back from that into, you know, what it is I do. And so what it is I do, um, is I'm, in, so I have titles, we have titles and stuff. I'm the executive director of the Green Lots Project, which is a, which is a community gardening and food autonomy slash food justice project. And so the way we achieve our food autonomy goals, that is um, autonomy, meaning we as individuals, as communities really, are able to develop a system where we are in control of our food system. We make the decisions. We're autonomous to make the decisions. No one else is doing that for us. We do that um, through community gardening primarily. And uh, we have, we've had in the past different gardens, the, 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 if, uh, the picture you see right there um, is our very first garden. We've had that 12 years and that's a very long time for a garden. It's a very long time for a community organization if you know anything about that. Mm -hmm. But especially for a garden. So we've been able to maintain it uh, for, for all this time and we've turned that into a food, food uh, a forest garden. Um, and then we have another garden project right now, which is a, a, a and these are both in the Roseland community. Uh, the picture you see there is a, in that picture is 104th and Wabash, where we have our uh, forest garden. And then about five blocks down on 104th, right at the tracks near Eggleston, that's the picture of that garden. Uh, we have another very big garden there, um, Sacred Greens Community Garden. And so uh, what we do is we uh, we're a, a member organization and in our organization, we have people who are members. That means you just work. It doesn't mean, you know, uh, it means you contribute in some way. You come out and hang out with us. And you're a member. Um, yeah. the, um, we're a member organization, so we grow a lot of food. We um, gather food. We forage food from our areas because we've set it up like a forest garden where we actually it's kind of like foraging in many ways and not, not, not and less like gardening. Uh, but there's some gardening and there's a lot of gardening in, 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 in these um in these gardens as well. So there's there's a gardening aspect to it and there's a foraging aspect. Yes. And, and so we, we get a lot of food for ourselves as members, but we also are able to distribute food and plant-based medicine to uh, to the community in, in various ways. We hold, we hold events. Um, a major part of what we do, though, I think uh, beyond what you see is the food going out. Well, you see less of us is using the food as medicine and you know stuff like that. And what you see even less maybe, um, unless you're thinking about it, is the, the teaching that goes on. Yes, I was just about to say that educational so, component. The wow. educational component. That's the, that's the piece that you don't see, but that's often the most important piece. And it's not that's only true. skills like you think, oh, I, can, I learned how to use a, a technology, a, a shovel, a hoe, or whatever. All that is very important. Yes, we do teach that. You learn, um, you get knowledge about how things grow. Yes. You get biology knowledge. There's a lot of stuff that, that we're able to teach us that is, that is uh, very formal, but there's also informal stuff like, um, you know, an understanding of who we are, Come an on. understanding of the importance of community, um, the understanding of 
the systems that we're in, that we're immersed in and that we're battling against really um you know and, and always these questions about and i think really the key issue is who are we yes who are we as a uh, people of mexican descent or people of uh, you know people that we call african-american or black people of african descent in this country yeah. Why, yeah. what does that mean and i think a lot of it for us I've, I've truly learned from working with the land and working with our elders that what that means is we are people who are close to the land we are land-based people uh or what we might call indigenous people. Yes. And we're just we're displaced. Mm. We've been forced from our lands where we uh, were very close to our land and very close to um, our, you know, again, traditions, not that they don't change and stuff like that, but we're very close to our land and we learn from our land. And there's a relationship that we have to it because we understand it. And we've been taken from those places and brought to a land that maybe is, is a little bit more foreign to us. Uh, yet we still have those that essence to us because these are folks. Remember, these are folks who have been on the planet for tens of thousands of years in yeah. place. I and mean, they were living in those places for thousands of years. So yeah. that, that we were taken 300, 400, 500 years ago to a new place that's really relatively um, short period of time in our in our history okay as in yeah, yes. on this continent and i'll speak for for people on this continent um, yeah. people on this continent a little bit um, we've been here for 10,000 20,000 perhaps even 30,000 years there's mm -hmm. been migrations and things like that but there's but there's been a, that this is our our land and we're working with it so our identity is who we are this is where mm -hmm. I'm getting at the point the big questions that we try to answer in the garden our identity is who we are, but we're indigenous people. We're land-based people. Yes. We just displaced from that, and, and our our cultures, our ways of being, have been attacked, and they've been they've tried to replace them. And what we get from the gardens when we go in there in the forest garden, is that we get an attachment to land, and that and that memory. I guess I'm not even sure what it is, but that, that uh, ancestral uh, dynamic. No, I don't claim to be any expert on that, but there's something that happens where we begin to understand that better. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Understand that that's who you are, okay? And yeah. then what we're able to do then is we're able to have, a, you know, there's a lot of really smart people, a lot of, uh, you know, wise people that come through the gardens, and we're able to have conversations about it as yeah. we're doing it, you know? And sometimes it doesn't, we don't even have to have a conversation, right? That's that's the point. But, uh, but sometimes we're able to have conversations that enhances the feelings that we're getting in this, like, wow, I'm, you know, you see that the, the the young man there, and you know, he's yeah. still, they love it. the children love it. They they come to it. now. They don't want to work hard all the time, but who does? When you have the ability to reap yeah. what you sow, that's more or less the benefit, and it's not just arduous work day exactly. in and day out. And and you know, I I, yeah. I love this this picture. Uh, Baba, that you're painting, because as you're talking, I'm just kind of like reminiscing and just just kind of feeling, you know, just being, you know, over there at the garden with you, because uh, when you uh, make this opportunity available, it is like a all in one educational system. Right. It's yeah. not subdivided into categories like, OK, this is where we're going to do this and this is where we're going to do this. And. This group of individuals, you stay in the academic portion, and this group of individuals yeah, yeah, yeah. come over here and do the work. No, we are all as a community, right? In Ubuntu, we're all coming together as one to 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 actually put into the earth a, a certain energy and allow that energy to come back to us. Yeah, right. And 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 it, and it's an educate. And as I hear you continue to talk, it's an education for for the head, the hand and the heart, for the community yes. Yes. and something, uh, traditions that have been passed down and given to us so that we can sustain and continue forward with a life and grow with the technology that we're getting, you know, that would be pre presented with for, for everyone, you know, not just for, you know, one group of people. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much, there's so much to talk about, about, you know, the, the about what we're doing the intergenerational piece where we're going from you know we're, we're connected with elders and children yeah. and yeah. young adults and and you know people my age uh you know so the intergenerational thing oh yeah. another thing I, there was one thing i wanted to mention when you said we come together yeah. and the way that you know there is this kind of mentoring thing that happens where people are mentoring but it's it's not just 
everybody has something to teach is I guess is the point I'm trying to make. And so we yeah. often learn not only like, oh, I've been in the gardens for 20 years. I'm a smart mm -hmm. guy. I got to teach everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, no, not at all. The people bring their bring their own intelligence and their own understanding. Yeah. We're able to um, I'm able to learn now. I'm, a, I'm executive director of the Green Lots Project. Um, if I took that, if I overemphasize that executive director position, we would be a less effective organization. I would be less capable because I wouldn't be learning from all those people who are able to bring their uh, amazing experiences. But the thing is, everybody has these experiences and you, it's not only in the garden that, you, that brings it out, although I think the garden is a particularly good place for this to happen. Uh, but it's also what has to happen is you have to uh, allow for that space socially. Mm -hmm. So yeah. not only the garden allow for it, but we as the humans in the garden have to allow for it. So, Because I could be, if I wanted to, and, and maybe I am sometimes, very authoritarian and say, no, this is all what we're going to do. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not, I don't think that's effective. That, again, isn't our traditions, I don't think. Yeah. And so you have a picture up of, of, um, of Mama Sophia Rashid, who is there learning uh, carpentry skills. Yeah. Right? Putting these things together. And we, that, that, um, particular uh work few days workshop that project that we did that you helped us do that you that you really did no, um, we that, did we did <laughs> yeah, we did. No, but i mean you you it was your vision you you mentored us through that but and so that's an example of listening to somebody who knows what they're doing mm -hmm. okay we and we all and so what's happening here is you see a woman who is extremely capable extremely smart and is a leader in her own right running her mm -hmm. own mini farm in the middle of the city uh that's uh safia rashid and she's she's on it she's fantastic she's incredible knows yeah. a lot and, and does a lot and she wanted to come over so she could learn a skill yes this is what i'm trying to point out as much knowledge as she has she wanted to get some knowledge from you yes and, and she so she came out and that's that's what the garden does it allow it opens that space where we're connecting as as um you know, with all our relatives, but in particular the, the humans. So you and I connected through the through the uh, lifeboat lifeboats permaculture guild and that, that yeah, uh, yeah. and um, solidified our relationship with Safi and a bunch of other people. Yes. And then the garden is that space where then we can say, let's work together, let's build community, let's trade skills and knowledge, um, and better our lives, and and then you know, and we become better teachers because we all understand now that it is important for us if we learn something of value to give it back. Yes, right? yes. thank and you. So, so that, that's what I see in this. That's what I see in this picture. Yeah. Uh, picture here yeah. Because, again, if you know Safiya and how, how what a leader she is, yeah. uh, you'd say, you know, in the traditional, uh, you know, sort of traditional, the, the Western European, the capitalist, colonialist version of education, she would be the one in front of the class, not the, not the student. Right. You know? You know, you know what I mean, and and I think that we're trying to get away from that model of education, and the uh, and at least I believe the gardens can do that if we have if we have a consciousness about what it is we're trying to do. Right, we're very aware that yes, we're trying to teach, but we're trying to teach in a fashion that um, provides dignity to the worker, to the land, to the student. Yes, yes, not a hierarchical relationship. I'm not in here to be your boss and to to dominate. I'm in here to build community with you. Yes. And um, you know, and learn from you. Yeah. So that, that's what we try to do. I think that's like that's the major thing from the uh, the garden. I think that happens. Um, you know, for for my family and for some of the other people, the other major thing that happens is we get a lot of food out of it. Um, yeah. But but what I've seen over the years, because this is um, this is twelve. We had twelve seasons at the Greenlands Project, and what I've seen over the years is that's the the biggest yield. That's the thing we get most out of the garden. Is you know consistently. Uh, is the educational piece and people not again not just the skills and all that but the questions of who are we as people and, and what do I plug into to my community and my society you know yeah. yes yes you know you uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Javunza and uh, Baba Fred and I'm gonna make sure and they've they've been on my list to make sure that they become a part of this discussion paper versus paper because I'm like you said, there are many individuals that can actually pour into our lives to assist us. And I, that's what I want our young people and our parents to kind of get out of this particular discussion is, is that we need people. You know, we, we, yeah. we are uh, uh, blessed 
to uh, and fortunate to have the, the education and degrees that we are able to attain today, but you can't get away from community and learning more about yourself and about your community and, and, and other professions to deepen the uh, the relationship of yourself with one another to 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 take forward those objectives that need to uh, or those projects those things that need to be done to promote uh, a self-sustaining world that you know more or less that we need so doctor yeah how do people get in contact with you as it relates to these particular projects? What's the best way for them to, to engage if, you know, if we have a young person or family that wants to come out to be a part of uh, these particular farming projects? Yeah, so um, there's a few ways. The, the, the one way that, that we've established uh, that I've really worked on very early on uh, in this is that we're going to be consistent. Uh, we're gonna, so, <laughs> oh, so, I've lost touch with people over the years, like friends, and they'll come by the garden on a Saturday because they'll know they'll find me. Okay, so mm -hmm. every Saturday morning, except you know for some rain things, or sometimes I have to go give a talk, or you know something like that, or family matters. But now even then, um, someone else is there to take over. Usually, every Saturday from nine to twelve, we're at four hundred seven West One Hundred Fourth Street. That's the Sacred Greens Community Garden. So you, uh, that's between May fifteenth. We made this commitment. May 15th, November 15th, every Saturday. Now, again, there's a few days that we miss. I think we missed three three uh, days this this uh, season. Uh, mm -hmm. One was super hot, and some of my interns were complaining that, why are you making us work when it's so hot? And so one day it was super uh -huh. hot, and, I, and it was on Saturday, and I said, okay, I'm going to call it off. And we could have worked that day, too, but anyway, that's another story. Right, um, right, right. right. Every, so that's the way. And then at our other garden, we were going there every Thursday morning uh, for several years, but that, that's changed. So, so but you, you can catch me there every Saturday, more or less, um, between May 15th and November 15th. That's the growing season. And even then, before then, we're usually out there. But I'm, I'm saying you'll definitely see us then, uh, 407 West 104th Street. And then uh, we have a Facebook page. The Green Lots Project. If you search yeah. that, you'll find and and what you see there is conversation. You see um, information, lots of uh, information about what we're doing. Uh, pictures, a lot of pictures about what we're doing, um, and schedules, things like that. Where we'll be, you know, where members will be. What our our we have weekly, like I say, uh, weekly work days. Sometimes we have more than one um, during a season, depending on what members decide. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a way to get a hold of us. You certainly can get a, a hold of me via email, okay. um, and that's P A N C H O M A C eight seven at hotmail dot com. Um, yeah, you can do that. Uh, yeah, so it's it's the Green Lots Project, and we're we're online. I know I know the young people uh, know how to do that stuff. So uh, yeah, that's us. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Amazing. And you know what was funny when you were just saying that day that it was hot outside. That yeah. was, that was hilarious because you know there was a time, you know, in indigenous cultures with our ancestors, you know, we have this this opportunity and option in today's time to go to the grocery store and get what we need. Yeah. But when there was a necessity in a time when, you know, the weather, uh, the hotness didn't matter because we realized that this was the day that we needed to be here in order to, to be able to provide for us for the next season. Yes. You know, we, we were out there and yeah. uh, man, what a, what a need for us not to lose track, not to lose. I'm just glad you say it, that you, you put it that way because th that is so true. That what we do again is we work with the cycles of nature. So you know we work with the land. So if it has to be done on this day because that's when it has to be, then you got to be out there. So I've been sick. I've I've had surgeries. I've broken ribs, um, in in you know on two different occasions. Um, I had I've had a, I had a shoulder thing. All from all from martial arts fun. <laughs> um, but, but I've had, you know, I had a weightlifting injury too, but you know, and I had to have surgery and all that, but I had, it was like, people say, you got to rest, you got to rest. I said, but, but if we don't plant, then we're not going to eat. Um, 
<laughs> which you know the, the the problem was the problem was with 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 my approach there was I was sick and hurt on those different occasions, and I shouldn't have been out there. Somebody because that, that that prolonged my illness, my uh, recovery. But somebody else should have been. See, and what where the failure was was not organizing my community. Mm. Uh, we weren't organized in a way where when I was hurt that somebody else could take over. Mm. So because we didn't have that, and that was you know a failure of leadership on my part, but it was also you know just you know the the world is is difficult right now. People are struggling, so it's hard sometimes. Um, but if we would have had our community organized, I could have rested. I could have recovered. Wow. You know. But I, but I wasn't. So I was out there during those times. And, you know, and I've been sick other times, you know, stuff like that. And I just have to be out there. Part of it is my passion. I think it also is a healing depending on how hurt you are. Right. You know, okay. it's right. healing to be out there. Um, and it's also my passion. And, and But but I also want to, you know, make that warning, too, that if you're not organized as a community, mm-hmm. that um, when you fall upon hard times as an individual, which we all do, yeah. Um, you know, it makes it that much more difficult. Right. You know? And so none of us can do it as individuals. So that community piece is very important. Now, what I was able to do and it wasn't even that bad. Yeah, clearly, I, you know, broken ribs. I was working with broken ribs. I was working right after surgery. What I was able to do was keep it afloat enough until uh, I was better to 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 um, have a harvest and things like that to, to, yeah. to provide for us. But it would have been much better on me and for our community if we would have been better organized. You know what, I mean, Baba Pancho, you, work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there were so many gold nuggets that were dropped into this particular discussion, man. I am yeah. just like, I'm, I'm looking forward for myself to go back and actually listen to it because, you know, it's just so important that we continually develop a mind of self-sustainability, community, and, 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 and what education, re- you know, really means and what... Yeah. We as parents and mentors and leaders and young emerging professionals, where we should be devoting our time, our energy, our focus, our resources. Yeah. So important. And, uh, you know, we usually end out uh, our uh, our discussion uh, with just the uh, just the added bonus, uh, like we've seen, I guess, in other other discussions and asking our guests professional you know, mm-hmm. if there is anything out there that you would like to refer a favorite book or a movie or something that had impacted you in your development mm-hmm. uh, that you'd like to kind of share with our audience that you think that they could use maybe to take with them uh, on their journey. There's so many at different points, you know, yeah. um, there's there's so many different points in my life. I would have to I'm, I'm trying to think of some. And somebody asked me that recently about, you know, of my favorite movie, a different kind of question. And I was like, geez, there's so uh, there's so many things that have impacted me at different points in life. Let me think about what I have been looking at recently. Maybe yeah. that maybe that would that would help. So recently, um, you know, and this is for um, an audience that um, wants to struggle a little bit with political economy. Okay, but recently I read a book that's really good, uh, a foodie's guide to capitalism. Okay, it talks about the food system because uh, the food system is 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 central, and I think we have to be able to understand the the food system. Uh, Raj Patel had a, a good uh, book too. If you uh, get his name, we okay. really have to understand the food system because it's all it's all going to start in, in our bodies. You know, if we're not, if our bodies aren't strong, then we there's nothing we can do. And if it, and that begins with what we put into it, right? So, uh, this guide to capitalism tells you about how the economic system works that we're a part of. Um, Raj Patel's book is a, is 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 a lot more like um, more journalistic type of writing, so it might be more consumable for people who aren't sort of academics or even you know students, um, uh, university students. But it's, it's not a hard read. Uh, that is food food is guide to capitalism. But Raj Patel's is more journalistic tell stories about sort of about the food system and supermarkets and how we're manipulated by uh, the capitalist uh, industrial agriculture. Mm. And those I think are really, really um, important things to know because once we do that, we start making better choices, become conscious, start many, making better choices for our bodies and then just yeah. minds follow. And it just, it just, that's how it works for me. When I became a vegetarian, I started thinking more about food and I started getting cleaner with the food. My mind started getting better and I started, it just was this cycle. And then it led me to, I mean, in, in one important way, led me to what it is that I do now, you know? Yeah. So so I think that, that book, Raj Patel's book, I can't remember what it's called, uh, his first book, 
And then um, a foodie's guide to capitalism. Uh, Who's that guy? What's that guy's name? Um, damn, I can't think of his name. The uh, the author of that. But those are books that were really important early on. Um, yeah, I can't think of. And, and, and those were in the again in one area of my life. And some other areas I'd have to think about. I think a great book, a great novel to read, if if you want a novel, is um, sure. is uh, Octavia Butler. You know Octavia Butler, okay. uh, you know grandmother of Afrofuturistic writing. Yeah. Uh, her uh, parable series. There's two books: Parables of the Seed and Parables of the Sower. And what she mm. does, she mixes uh, sort of a, again a futuristic thing with some important indigenous wisdom, with some spirituality and African indigenous wisdoms, with some spirituality. Uh, in a time like ours, but a more drastic time where there's a lot more, uh, it's a lot more severe than it is in terms of food and violence. And we live in some ugly times right now, but she's, she's, she pointed to 20 years down the line, if, if like this Trumpism kind of thing, you know, this ugliness, which is really Americanism, right? Usism. Mm -hmm. um, if that continues, we're going to go down this line where, where um, uh, Ms. Butler um, takes us and she's, she's going back to indigenous wisdoms and African wisdoms to, to survive. So wow. it's a beautiful novel. Those two, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Seed, um, great books. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah. Dr. Pancho, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you so welcome. much for your time. And I just wanted to encourage our audience to make sure during the periods of March 15th and November 15th. May, May 15th, November 15th. 15th. Yeah, come on now, get it straight, Coach Green Jean. Yep. May 15th to November 15th, you can catch Dr. Pancho McFarlane uh, and, and, Green Locks the, Project. and the Green Locks Project. Give us that address again. 407 West 104th Street. Yes, 407 West 104th Street. Please yeah. come out, yeah. not support, but be a part. Be, be a, a part member. And be a member. Yes, it is nothing but win win when it comes to putting your hands back into the dirt, putting the energy yeah. into the soil, and allowing that energy to come back to replenish, heal, and serve your needs. Dr. Pancho, thank you so much. Thank I also you. wanted to uh, give a shout out to the uh, 3H Intro to Pre Apprenticeship Workshop. And if you're interested, and becoming a part of that workshop, again, ages from 12 to 17 on basic construction, safety, and technology. You can register your young person at coachgreengene.com. And we also have a uh, YouTube page with free content re regarding these self-sustaining skill sets uh, at Coach Green Gene. That is our YouTube page. So please like, share, and subscribe. And uh, we'd like to thank you guys for joining in. Please take time uh, to share this particular broadcast with family and friends uh, and members, because I know that it will be encouraging to them as, as it was for you so that we can continue to grow and build legacy. Thank you, guys. Dr. Pancho, appreciate you, thank sir. You. Thank you. Yes, sir. Take care now.